I am so excited today to be joined by Dr. Rika Kumar. She is an endocrinologist in New York City. She currently serves as an associate professor of clinical medicine and attending endocrinologist at the Weill Cornell Medical College and specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of weight management, among other health issues. She is also the chief medical officer of Found Health, which is an online weight loss program, which I'm excited to hear more about. Uh, Dr. Kumar, thank you so much for joining us today. I know this weight loss is a very hot topic right now, and it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. We've known each other for a little while, and we've chatted about metabolism and how things change in science. And now it's like there's this weight loss drug or drugs, and um, it seems to be you know increasing in popularity. I personally haven't seen anything like this um, in my 25 years as a nutritionist. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Excited for your expert input on this, because so many people are concerned about weight loss and about, you know, are interested in, if not taking these medications already. You know, it's interesting. We know there's a big push for weight acceptance and healthy body image, and no one's denying that. But we also know that nearly one in three adults are overweight and more than two in five have obesity. So it is a problem. We also know that obesity is associated with other medical issues such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and other health issues. So my first question for you is if a patient comes to you for weight loss, what is your first plan of action? Like, what do you tell them? So my first plan of action would probably first be a, a medical assessment of their weight. So do they actually have obesity? So that doesn't just mean high BMI. That means, you know, are they carrying an excess amount of fat that impairs their health? And that is technically the World Health Organization's definition of obesity. It shouldn't just be related to BMI or just a number on the scale, but it's an excess amount of body fat that impairs health. So I look for things such as um, medical complications of excess adipose, such as diabetes, prediabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart disease. And often people may have one of those, but Sometimes there are what we call pre-conditions, pre-diabetes, pre-hypertension. So we don't want to wait for somebody to develop a disease. But if it looks like somebody's heading in that direction based on their family history, based on continued gain of fat over time, then you know we want to treat these people too. And so my first step would usually be a thorough medical assessment to see if they actually have what looks like medically complicated obesity or overweight versus just high mass, right? I, there are people that just wants to lose 10 pounds. They're not coming to you necessarily. I hope not. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Got it. And so what, if let's say they do qualify according to the definition that you just explained, what would be your first, you, you know, your first step in terms of treatment? Yeah. So my first step would actually be to figure out like what kind of obesity do they have? And that's not really a common way that we speak. Everyone assumes that all weight gain is the same, but people eat for different reasons. And there are different pathways in the body that may not function properly when somebody's carrying excess weight. There's people that don't eat very much. There could be something off with their hormones or metabolism. So I try to figure out if we're going to use medicine, what is the right match? And the right medicine isn't appropriate for anyone. And I've really been emphasizing this in the face of the Ozempic craze and the GLP-1 craze, where although these are new, very effective medicines, they might not be right for everyone. So an example could be if somebody is carrying extra weight and excess fat because of a a night eating or craving problem, often that's actually a different class of medicines versus a GLP-1, not all the time, but many times. So I try to figure out like what the underlying thing going on is. Is it related to blood sugar? Is it related to perimenopausal weight gain? Is it related to cravings? That's my first step. Once I've established that, I, I always go after behavior first. Um, are there any modifiable behaviors within someone's control that we can try to change? If the answer is no, meaning they've tried everything or they're just unable to do it for various reasons, I would say that perhaps it's their biology driving their behavior. And that's where I start looking at medicines. And this is even if someone qualifies for your definition of obesity or someone who is at risk of a health condition, you'll still start with the lifestyle changes first if they're able and willing. Absolutely. Even if somebody qualifies for medicine, I think the medicine sometimes is only as good as 
the behavior change. The medicine should be used to really improve adherence to the behavior change. Although the medicines can be very effective without behavior change, that's not a good long lasting strategy for weight care because people will lose muscle. They won't learn the right habits. And so ideally the medicines are used to improve adherence to the right habits. And what's the right amount of time to try lifestyle like diet and exercise before deciding that, okay, you know what, this isn't cutting it. You know, we need to start thinking about medicine. Yeah. I, I, that's becoming a tricky question. Some people say that the concept of it is actually like loaded with weight bias. And and I, this is interesting because right. If someone comes to us with high cholesterol or high blood pressure, and we see that reading a few times, technically they qualify for medicine. Do we say to them, have you tried three to six months of restricting salt? Have you tried three to six months of restricting fat? Yes, we want those things, but we'll still offer the medicine. So I would say in terms of behavior change for for weight management, there's probably not a strict, strict amount of time. I think it's very like case-based and it's not that we'd withhold the medicine, but we really know that the combination of both behavior plus addressing biology is the optimal. Prior to surgery, Doctors might say, you know, you need to show like six months of lifestyle intervention. Some people even feel like that's a biased approach. But I would say that I would love to do both at the same time. Usually by the time I see someone, they've already tried several times. Right. And it's interesting. I bias because it's almost assuming that the person has a lack of willpower, right? For example, as if they could only, you know, try to harder with diet, right? As opposed to just, you know, getting on it. (laughs) I I just see the results and I could see why people might start sooner rather than later. Let's talk specifically about these drugs. Wagovi is FDA approved for weight loss and Ozempic. They're similar drugs though. Ozempic is used off-label for weight loss because it's FDA approved for type two diabetes, but they're similar drugs. So how exactly do they work? I know you mentioned GLP-1 antagonist or agonist, but that seems to work on appetite, right? It does work on appetite, but it works a, a few different ways to affect appetite. So GLP-1 receptor agonists were initially made as type 2 diabetes medicines because they stimulate the pancreas to make insulin and to stabilize or lower blood sugar. These medicines also delay gastric emptying, so your stomach stays full for longer, so that increases fullness. And probably the most interesting mechanism of the medicines in regards to weight management is that the medicines actually stimulate the fullness center of the brain. So Mm -hmm. as if fullness signals are coming in, telling the area of the brain that senses fullness that the, the patient or person is full. And normally the way that center of the brain is triggered is by gut hormones after a meal that signal fullness to the brain. And people that struggle with their weight, with diabetes, there could potentially not be enough of this. There could not be enough of it over time, or perhaps there's resistance to it, whereby supplementing it, people can feel full. Simulating the process that happens once you eat, that fullness feeling, even if you're not necessarily experiencing it, the medicine helps you. It sort of like speeds up the process, it seems like. Yeah, it certainly mimics the process. And so, yeah, what I would often tell people is to use that newfound control not to not eat. The purpose isn't to forget to eat or to try to totally restrict. The point is to use that newfound control to make good choices that you weren't previously able to make. Now, these are hunger hormones, right, that are released after a meal, but these are the ones that shut off eating, right? When you're full, they're sort of like responsible for being satiated. Yeah. So we could call them fullness hormones. Okay. No, that's right. They're in the family of hunger and fullness hormones. No, it's fascinating. I have to say, I personally am amazed at how well these drugs work, um, especially because so many weight loss drugs in the past have been unsuccessful. I have never seen anything work this well in the past 25 years. And a friend of mine who was taking it, I think put it best. She said, I now know what it's like to eat like a normal person. Like I, she, her appetite never shut off. And to me, that's fascinating that it would have this effect in terms of appetite. Is it just the appetite though, or is there something else at play or is it really just working on, like you say, the appetite and the gastric emptying? 
there are probably other things the medicine is doing that we may not even know about yet at the level of the liver and, you know, potentially cardiovascular protection. So I, I think that there's likely other benefits that we'll hopefully find out about and hopefully not risks that we find out about as people are on these longer. But I would say the major mechanisms are the ones that we mentioned. I know one study showed a loss of 15% of body weight after 68 weeks. And when they had compared that to the group that only followed lifestyle changes, the loss was like 2.4%. So that's a big discrepancy. Why does semaglutide work so well, the active ingredient? That's consistent with a lot of um, pharmacotherapy trials where the lifestyle arm, you know, maybe loses two to 4% and the intervention arm something much more. The reason it works so well, or one of the reasons is that if you look at what happens in the placebo arm, so what happens when people try to lose weight through diet and exercise, if you look at what happens to their hunger and fullness hormones, they all move in the direction you don't want them to move, meaning your fullness hormones go down, your hunger hormones go up and your metabolism slows down. Wow. And yeah, so that, that just shows you why our biology is really, you know, set up to not support sustained weight loss. It's very wow. hard once someone has gained excess weight to lose it and keep it off. And so the way these medicines work is that by supplementing a level of a fullness hormone, you are counteracting what we call that metabolic adaptation, meaning wow. those hormonal changes that happen after weight loss that drive weight regain. This wow. medicine is counteracting a piece of that. That's fascinating. So you're saying if we just went about our business, we're actually, it, the odds are stacked against us based on our biology, because it's sort of like our body wants to maintain its yeah. original weight, right? The set Correct. point, I learned a lot about set point theory during my training. And, you know, I hear a lot about how, you know, people need to stay on these medicines in order for them to work because of, you know, what you're saying. And if not, the hormones will shift again, and then you may regain weight. But in your opinion, if someone loses like 50 pounds, does their set point not adjust at all? I mean, really, I would think it would take a lot for someone to regain that amount of weight. I'd like to think that the stomach shrinks or that there's some other compensation in one's favor that would enable them to maybe wean off the drug. What do you think? Yeah. So it's it's probably not as black and white as, as we think. The traditional teaching and science right now does say to stay, that people should stay on these medicines. But the interesting part of your question was you said, does the set point reset at all? Right. So even a little. And, okay. and and we don't know the answer, <laughs> but is it possible to come off of these medicines and keep off some of the weight? Probably. And is that perhaps the set point resetting a little? Maybe. But right now, what we see a year or two years after coming off the medicines is most of the weight is regained. Could somebody regain maintain a percentage of weight loss and improve their lifestyle so much that they're in better health, likely that's possible. Mm -hmm. Part of the challenge, I think, are the cultural thoughts around thinness and wanting to keep as much weight off as possible rather than having it centered around health. So mm -hmm. when somebody loses a significant amount of weight and they reach a low and they regain, they tend to fixate on wanting to go back to the low weight. And that's part of the psychology of it. Well, maybe they are healthier. Maybe they are healthier keeping off 25 of the 50 pounds, but they tend to not be so thrilled with that. Mm -hmm. Well, they're used to seeing themselves at an even lower weight. So they kind of want to stay at that weight that they've achieved. Um, yeah, no, I, I could see how that can happen. What about someone, I, I know a lot of people who are taking these drugs who are not obese, who don't have other health concerns, other health issues. They've tried diet and exercise and just like others, you know, it's not necessarily about willpower. They, they just can't lose the 10, 15 pounds. They're not obese. They're not significantly overweight. They may not even have health issues, but they're taking it to get the weight off. I would say that it sometimes makes me nervous because it's, it's just not what the medicines were studied for, right? Generally, normal weight people who aren't happy with their weight, these medicines were intended for people with medically complicated obesity and type 2 diabetes. So although they may work to lose the 5 or 10 pounds, the safety of that sometimes concerns me. But how are you saying that it might work 
differently in a smaller body, like the mechanism might be different such that it might create other issues that just haven't been studied yet? It would probably work quite well, which is probably what's scary. And that's what we're seeing. <laughs> and that's why people are you know, getting into this is that when your brain is more sensitive to these signals, the meds probably work even better. That doesn't mean that people should be abusing it for vanity pounds, which is what people right. are calling it these days. Um, in terms of negative effects, we probably would see more nausea, more vomiting, and mm. everyone's talking about ozempic face. And so if you don't have a lot of fat to lose, you're going <laughs> to lose fat in your face. <laughs> you know, I laugh about that because I think anytime you lose a significant amount of weight, you know, you lose weight in your face. So I, one of my colleagues said, it's not ozempic face, it's called weight loss, <laughs> you know, but you're right. Like someone who's thin to begin with is probably going to look a little gaunt if they, if they lose a significant amount. What is the longest that this, these class of drugs um, has been studied? So it's actually quite a long time. I, I think that the media craze is very recent, but if you look at the way, you know, original forms of the drugs like Bietta and Bidurion, it's, it's actually probably been 15, 20 years since we've hmm. been prescribing a version of it. And then Victoza, then Saxenda, like what, five, 10 years ago. So the medicines actually have been studied. Way, and I just want to say, these are all versions of semaglutide or similar to semaglutide. Uh, they're in the class of GLP-1 receptor right. agonists. Semaglutide is one of the newer ones. Um, uh, liraglutide was an older version. And prior to that, there were actually older ones as well. So we've studied the mechanism for a long time, but in terms of like this amount of people on the newest versions that cause this amount of weight loss is recent. Mm -hmm. And among those individuals, like, what is it like a two-year study that we've seen in terms of the more recent versions of these drugs? Yeah. The more recent, I would say we have like two to three-year data at the most. Mm -hmm. Interesting. In terms of side effects, you know, we know that oftentimes any kind of drug will come with unwanted side effects. How do you know when the risks of the side effects outweigh the risks of being overweight? And are they of concern to you? What do you have to say about, you know, avoiding some of these side effects, which can be pretty unpleasant? Yeah, I think that's like the key point when we're prescribing is does the benefit outweigh the risk. And that's the conversation I always have with people who I don't think qualify that want to try the medicine that have an amount of weight to lose, but perhaps in them or in those individuals, the risk outweighs the benefit. And I recommend something else. In people where their excess weight is more of a risk to them than the risks of the medicine, then we are willing to tolerate some side effects, perhaps some nausea, maybe some reflux. And we're willing to treat through those because the benefit of the medicine is so great to them. And it should be a gradual increase, right? The dosage changes over time. The dosages uh, do increase over time. For most of these medicines, we can escalate the dose every four weeks. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can't because of side effects. And so there are scenarios where not everyone reaches the highest dose, but the intended prescribing is to reach the maintenance dose of of the newer medicines. Do you have a lot of your patients that are currently on these drugs and how are they doing? Yeah, uh, I would say that I have a decent amount of patients on these medicines. I'm a general endocrinologist, so not everyone I treat falls into this category, but of my patients that do, at this point, I would say probably 50 or 60% of my patients might be on something like this, of the patients I treat for their weight and diabetes. So it's a lot. I would say that they're doing really well. There's some that have been on for years, and, and of the ones that either are not responding great or don't like how they feel, I'm... I don't push it too much. I, I say, let's try something else. Mm -hmm. Right. I noticed like not everybody will respond mm -hmm. at the same rate or even at all, which to me was very interesting to learn, even though you would think it would have the same physiological effect based on the mechanism that it, it doesn't necessarily. Yeah. Which just speaks to, you know, how unique each person's biology is. There is a risk with any weight loss of a loss of muscle mass. And we know that as we get older, it's very important to preserve our muscle mass. It keeps our metabolism running strong, you know, just is important for so many health reasons. Are you concerned about the loss of muscle mass that can accompany any large amount of weight gain, whether on these drugs or not? I, I am concerned about muscle loss and I'm concerned about people's ability to maintain protein requirements and do resistance training if they're overly reliant on the appetite suppression from the medicine. I think there's probably a sweet spot in dosing where appetite is controlled, but we're not, you know, 
really restricting food so much that energy is depleted, protein intake is low. We really want to make sure that people are doing those things because of the risk of muscle loss. You mentioned earlier that it depends on the person, what you will actually prescribe and for not for appetite is not necessarily the issue for everyone, but if it's not appetite, are you thinking something like emotional eating or what, what else could it be? I would think everything is ultimately appetite ultimately is affected by pretty much anything. I guess the question is, where is that appetite coming from? Is it coming from your stomach? Is it coming from your emotions? Is it coming from your brain? Is it coming from a medication you're taking that's stimulating the appetite? So yes, ultimately it's the, you know, intake of calories, but what is determining that intake and what is going into that feeling of needing to eat? I did so many years of weight loss counseling. It was just a matter. A lot of times it was just the emotional eating. People weren't hungry, but you know, they were bored or they were tired or they were stressed. And that was the trigger for them to eat. And that was the biggest contributor to the weight gain. Let's shift gears a little bit to talk about children. Obesity now affects 15 million children and teenagers in the United States, according to CDC data. And there were some new guidelines that were recently issued from the American Academy of Pediatrics that pediatricians should offer weight loss drugs for children of age 12 and up for those children that have obesity. What is your opinion of this? Is it too young to start? So I'm an adult endocrinologist, so I I can't say for sure, but my feeling is that treating early and preventing worsening obesity with complications should be a priority and for you know pediatric endocrinologists and pediatric obesity medicine specialists. So similar to adults, I think we probably want to be aggressive in a in complement to lifestyle intervention. So the medicines, they really are quite safe. And the ones that are FDA approved starting age 12, I think could be a good option where patients are probably on their way to developing diabetes by the time they're teenagers. Wow. And I would think if you can control it sooner rather than later, then that's better. I'm personally all for medications. I don't think I'm among a lot of company in my community. I just am amazed at how these medicines work and what a great aid they can be to people who really struggle, how it really does affect the appetite. And, you know, we talk a lot about willpower when we, you know, and and all these like strategies and, you know, to mentally sort of stave off food and I'm just amazed that how this, the way the drug works really shows that it's not necessarily about willpower. And can we talk about that a little bit? Like, what are your thoughts about, you know, obesity being a disease and that it's not just about willing yourself to eat less food? Anything where there's, you know, dysfunction or dysregulation of organs in the body is the definition of a disease. And we see that in obesity. And we don't mean five pounds or 10 pounds overweight that can be treated with modified lifestyle, but true excess body fat that is impairing the function of things like your pancreas, your liver, your heart. The fact that there is organ dysfunction supports that it's a disease. Is there a component of behavior involved in the progression of this disease? Absolutely. But that is true for a lot of diseases. And that link between biology and behavior is complex, but I think there's enough scientific evidence in this field to show that this isn't willpower on its own, especially Mm -hmm. when we look at genetics and how all those factors play in. Mm -hmm. And do you believe genetics can play a significant role in whether or not one becomes overweight or obese? Yeah. One of the biggest risk factors for developing obesity for a child is having a first degree relative with obesity. And some of that could be environmental, but if you look at, you know, twin studies and things like that, there are big genetic components. If someone did want to lose the 10, 15 pounds without medicine, is there a specific diet that you would recommend typically, or is it just about, you know, eating fewer calories? Like, I'm just curious what your nutrition philosophy is. I would send them to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm I'm open. I I don't have a, a one, you know, one size fits all approach. I tend to not love fad diets of any sort. You know, my patients will convince me that they want to do keto or want to do this or that. Perhaps it's effective in the short term, and I try to be supportive. But I would say that my answer is consistent with 
all the guidelines, some version of a low glycemic, non-processed Mediterranean diet, which of course is very vague. Um, (laughs) You know, people want much more strict guidelines, but I would say my my approach is probably pretty balanced. (laughs) Sounds good to me. Yeah, it can be pretty vague. And I think it's so important to see like what someone is actually eating as a baseline. And then like, that's, that would be my approach to kind of go through their diet, you know, meal by meal. But let's talk about your new company. You are the chief medical officer of Found Health. Tell us about it. I joined the company about a year and a half ago, and it's a digital health company that combines behavior change plus biology for weight management. So we have health coaches, really awesome app and engaged community to help on the behavior change side. But we also have a whole telehealth side where physicians can assess patients and prescribe FDA approved medicine if indicated. So we're really trying to you know, use technology to combine biology plus behavior and treat patients at scale. How are the patients doing on the program? So I would say that generally they're doing well, but a lot of it depends on getting it right. Like, are we picking the right intervention? Are we picking the right diet? Are we picking the right medicine? And I think these days when people are getting something on the internet, they want quick results. And sometimes the first thing they do doesn't work. And there's, you know, a tendency to then want to change and try something else. But, you know, just like the doctor's office, I would say even a digital health platform may require some adjustments. And overall, members are doing really well, but we also really want to manage their expectations of what you know, medical weight loss is and a healthy pace of weight loss. So every patient gets a consultation with you or another weight loss physician, right? It's not just like they're doing this on the fly or on their own. No, no, no. If they meet criteria for medical treatment, they would have a consultation with a physician that works with the company and they would get a prescription if indicated. Insurance companies, I know a lot of insurance companies haven't been on board you know, to reimburse for these weight loss drugs, even though we know that even as little as five, losing 5% of your body weight can really decrease your risk of obesity related diseases. Are you finding that the insurance companies, whether through your work at Cornell or through Found Health, are you finding that they're sort of picking up in terms of their acceptance and their willingness to cover weight loss medicines? Very slowly, but not fast enough. And the newer medicines are just priced way too high. Yeah. I know a lot of people who are paying out of their pocket and uh, they are definitely pricey. Uh, Are you concerned that it's going to create too low of a supply for those who may need it for, let's say, type 2 diabetes, which it's, you know, Ozempic is FDA approved for that. Is there worry that there's going to be a shortage? There had been shortages. A lot of the shortages were related to supply chain and manufacturing issues, but also because of demand that wasn't expected. Currently, right now, there really aren't many shortages. And hopefully, if medicines are being prescribed appropriately, people with diabetes getting diabetes medicine, people with obesity getting obesity medicine, that we should be able to manage this. I'm curious, do you know of physicians who prescribe it sort of off label or even, um, you know, if someone doesn't meet the criteria or do you find that most physicians are keeping with the guidelines and maybe you don't want to answer that, but no, no, no. the the ones I know, I think are are doing, you know, just fine. And I think that when we do prescribe off label, there's usually a good reason for it. I can't speak to like the what's going on at Medi spas and people walking out of like hair salons with a prescription. That's a totally different story. Is there anything you wanted to add that we haven't covered? I mean, I think we covered a lot of topics. I really am a big advocate for being strong and healthy and fit. So I think that the strength and protein part is really important. And I think we hit all the other topics. I'm so happy we could reconnect over this. Same. And if someone wants to find out about your online weight loss program, where can they go? What's the website? Yeah. So they can just look me up for my practice in New York City. But if they're interested in the digital health platform, it's joinfound.com. Joinfound.com. Terrific. Dr. Rika Kumar, thank you so much for being with us and sharing such great information and your expertise. I know a lot of people are going to benefit from it. You can find her program online, join found, and thank you again for being here. It was a pleasure. Thank you.